Today's class is more on the softer topics around data analysis. Some people will call them tricks, other people call them just state of the art or extra things that you've learned. But they're usually things that are not uh, published in many journal publications. They're things based on experience and know-how. Uh, is what we're going to cover mainly today. And the nice thing is, on the, at least the first part on uh, the advanced data pre-processing methods, is that they don't apply just to PLS and PCA. You can use it for these squares models as well, or any of your other modeling work that you do in your graduate research or when you start working. So don't uh, don't think that this is only valid for PCA and PLS today's material. It certainly covers covers models as well. So we've got quite a few different pre-processing tools that uh, you haven't seen before. We'll, we'll start with centering and scaling, which are the two pre-processing steps that we've always used since the first class here. But we'll quickly introduce a few others that uh, you may have seen these as options in the software already, um, and we'll, I'll explain what they do. And then we'll just describe here how to treat particular types of variables, like integer and categorical variables. How do we deal with uh, dynamics from a, from a system and feature extraction? We'll I'll very briefly cover feature extraction because I'll spend a lot more time on that um, in the next class. Okay, so centering's purpose is to remove the offset from a variable. Most of our variables are not centered at zero naturally. We, as uh, our engineering units are, whatever they might be, are usually based on starting at zero and moving up. So our data, to get it all back to center, we just subtract that mean. And what happens? If you do not center your data and you start to fit a PC model to it, either PCA or PLS model to it, is that you sometimes have to use an extra component in order to fit that model. And the reason for it is quite quite straightforward to see. If we go back to our, our three axes, x1, x2, x3, and let's say our data lie up here, uh, this is our raw values now, we haven't centered yet. The first component has to start at the origin and it goes to in the direction of greatest variance. Okay. So P1 always starts at the origin or at least goes through the origin. So it will go through the origin and go in the direction of greatest variance, which is going to be right there. So this is going to be my P1 direction. And then P2 is forced to be orthogonal to P1. And it's going to go through, say, that direction. And then I can put a third component, which will be a component of those two still. Okay. So you can see the problem here is that the first component is almost meaningless. It's going in a direction just to go from the origin to, the, to, the, to the, uh, pass through the, roughly the center of that data path. And really, the only information you're going to get is from the second component, P2, then. Oh, sorry, P2 will pass through the origin. Yeah, right. But I, I'm sorry, I'm projecting it up along to that point. You're absolutely right. P2 will pass through the origin. Uh, but projected in that direction, it's, it's going to be that. So you're not really explaining a, an informative uh, amount of variation. Certainly, you're wasting this extra component, P1. And then P2 may not be in the direction of greatest variance. Okay, so we're really disregarding P1. P2 now, which we expect to be the next greatest direction of variance, really isn't going to necessarily be in that direction of variance anyway. Okay. So centering is can have a major impact on how you interpret the model. And that paper that I mentioned here by Rowan Smilder, that's an excellent paper to read to understand what centering is doing. It does use a bit of mathematics. To, to get there, but it's well worth the time spent reading that paper um, to understand what centering is doing. The other thing to know about centering is you don't always have to use the mean. You can center about any natural reference point that makes sense, as long as it's somewhere in the middle of that, that variable. So, so your particular variable x starts with k, use a, a natural reference point, the, like the set point might be a good example, because we know we're going to always be above and below that. And as, as a few of you have asked me before, why can't you just center around the median instead for robustness? 
absolutely center around the media. But the problem is most software packages that you use, they don't have that as an option. So if you do want to do this, you have to pre-center your data outside the software, maybe in MATLAB or Excel or Python, and then bring your data into the software and then tell the software, don't center and scale this anymore. Just leave, leave the data alone. I've already pre-treated it myself. Um, so unfortunately, that's really not an option in most software packages. So that's about all I'm going to say about centering. Scaling is done because different variables have different degrees of variation. And the purpose of PCA and PLS is to explain variation. So if, if variables are, are left unscaled in your model, the model is going to naturally fit the directions of raised variance, which are the, the variables that, have been, that happen to have the raised direction of variance. Okay, so that's why, without any prior knowledge, we always set, scale all the variables to unit variance to give every variable an equal chance of participating in the model. Here you see. A, a, a crude illustration of two variables, x1 and x2, and if I scale x1 so that it's 10 times more uh, dominant than x2, so the variance of x1 is 10 times that of x2, so you can see that here, this, the scale of x1 versus the scale of x2 is, is much larger, so that first component is just going to map into the direction of x1 predominantly. And now, for multiple variables, we don't always know this. We can't see this as easily as in this illustration. So we always just scale to unit variance. But if you do know that a variable should be more important in the model, there's no reason why you can't first center and scale all your data, and then upscale and downscale variables relative to that uh, initial scale. So first scale to unit variance, so that everything has an equal weighting. And then if you want to make a variable twice as important as the other variables, you just multiply its column by two. And that, that will multiply, or you have to multiply by the column by four to get the standard deviation equal to two, so then it becomes doubly as important as the other variables. So I, 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 my colleagues do this a lot at work. They want certain variables to dominate the model. They first scale to unit variance, and then they upscale other variables after, particularly variables that you all you want to have them along in a monitoring system if they go even slightly out of, out of their, their bounds. You want to pick that up. You can upscale that variable so it, it's important in the model and gets greater weight in, in say, T1 or T2 or in, in whichever component it happens to be. What's the one for upscale? No, no, it's, it's arbitrary, right? So you can upscale and downscale as you like. If you scale to zero, you're basically putting in a column of zeros, and the, and the PCA just will ignore that variable. It okay, will get zero weight. But then anything from zero up, is just it just keeps going and going. The risk is, of course, if you give a variable a weight of 10,000 and all the other variables are one, the model is just going to go into that direction of that, that variable with the higher weights. Because I was trying once, like one of my data set and persons is told me that the column has a standard deviation of zero. So what's, what's the solution for, for such a case? Well, what does it mean if a column's got a standard deviation of zero? There is no variables to be added. Okay, and what do you do about it? <laughs> but actually, but this column, like, there's one of the main, main variables that's actually one of the monitor that's in that process. Okay, which indicates that the training dates that you happen to have has no variation. Okay, so if it is an important variable, you need to ensure that that variable actually has some variation in it. Otherwise, yeah, the model is only going to be, it only sees that data. But if you if you know that this variable is really important, you need to ensure that it, it's, the model sees the variation. So just uh, uh, to be, uh, this is probably something similar to what you had, Yasu, right? You had a variable that was roughly all just constant. Now what happens if, if it is mostly constant but every so often there's a short blip away from the mean and you calculate this, this standard deviation, it's going to be a small standard deviation, right? Contrast that to this variable over here which has got a fair amount of variation. You, when we're scaling, we're dividing through by the standard deviation. Here we're dividing through by a larger value than in this case. 
So in this second variable case, when we're dividing by a small standard deviation, we're actually inflating the variance of that variable. This small blip after scaling is going to be much larger, and we're going to inflate the distance for, from the mean for those variables because we're dividing through by a small number. So this point will stand out as a, as a strong outline, most likely in the score plot. So just be careful of that. So there's this heuristic that's kind of come about, if you read a few papers, you may see this from time to time. If the variance of a variable is four, less than four times its known measurement noise, so this requires you to have some prior knowledge of what is typical measurement noise for this variable. And if that standard deviation is less than four times that amount, uh, you don't scale that variable because you're going to actually, you're actually upscaling its noise by, by scaling. And then the other thing you can do is you can scale, instead of dividing through by the standard deviation, which can be arbitrarily inflated even just by one outlier, scaling by the MAD is much more resistant to outliers because here, you first, you calculate the MAD as a surrogate for the standard deviation. Okay. And the way it's calculated is you say, take my variable x, subtract from x the median of that entire column, okay. take the absolute values of those terms, and then recalculate the median now of that new value, of that new column, multiply it by this factor up front. And that factor up front is just a consistency factor. So that if xk happens to be a normally distributed variable already, with no outliers, and you calculate this quantity over here with that, that scaling factor up front, you'll get the standard deviation of 1. Okay, so it's just to bring what would normally have been good data into alignment with the definition of the MAD. Again, this is a, 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 a centering, uh, sorry, a scaling term that's not available in a lot of the software packages. I certainly haven't seen it in any of the commercial company software. So if you wanted to use median uh, centering and scaling by the MAD, you'd have to do that in MATLAB, say, ahead of time to bring your data in, and then tell it not to center and scale after that. Okay, so something you haven't seen before is block scaling or group, group wise scaling. This is something that's, that's very helpful when dealing with big chunks of data of, of a homogeneous type. So in this particular example, I'm taking a distillation column, and I've got 80 tags. Let's say of those 80 tags, 50 of them are my tray temperatures, which is not uncommon on modern distillation columns. They will have temperature sensors on almost every tray. And the other three tags in my data set would be other types of variables, like pressures and flow rates around the columns. Okay, so what will the PCA model do in this particular case? What would you expect P1's duration and T1 to be modeled in this particular column? The temperatures most likely. The temperatures most likely, because they're probably moving in a very similar pattern. Right, yeah, you've got eight, uh, of your 80 variables, five, five eighths of your variables are of moving up and down together. All the temperatures in this column move together. So it's totally expected that that first component is really going to be modeling and mapping temperature variability. So you'll see all your 50 temperatures have quite high weights in that first component, and it really doesn't pay too much attention to the other variables. Then in your second and third component, you may start to see the other variables play a role. But that dominant source of variation is going to be due to these 50 temperatures that just swamp the entire model. So if you don't want that, uh, or if you know that really these 50 trade temperatures are not providing 50 independent sources of information to you, it's very common in, in uh, practice to just do a block scaling of them. So you first do your normal centering and scaling, so everything is at unit variance after this step. Then you go and take those 50 trade temperatures and you divide them column by column, divided by one over the square root of 50. Okay, so KB is the number of variables within your block of consistent type. So KB in this case is 50. So you divide through those, though just those 50 columns are divided through by the square root of 50. You don't touch the other 30. Now, that entire block of 50 columns have the weight in the model of one variable. They have the equivalent impact on the model as if they were really one variable. You 
because you've got to make the numbers in that column numerically much, much smaller by dividing uh, you divide it through by the square root of 50. So you've, you've downscaled the weights, of, uh, uh, sorry, downscaled the impact of those columns in the model. And it's as if your model really only had 31 variables. The 30 other tags plus now the model sees the equivalent of one extra temperature tag. Question. Uh, what you what you may lose is we'll talk. You'll see it in, in the case study we look at uh, after the break. Um, PCA and PLS will tend to put when it sees all these correlated variables, it puts roughly equal weight onto all of them. So you've now gone and reduced the weight of all those variables. What you find in the loadings plot then, uh, let's say P1 versus P2, is you'll find your other variables whichever 30 they are, all over the place. And then you'll find the 30 variables right here, but they seemingly have much smaller weights. So you may be tempted to say, well, relative to these others, there's no impact on the, on the model from this, because this now has small weight. But really, you have to see that as times 50. It, it's, it's, it's in the P2 direction, but it's, it's a cluster all on its own. So yeah, you do lose a bit of interpretation, but. That's why you've done block scaling, so that you don't want these 50 temperatures to swamp the entire model. Um, and, our, and usually you know that these temperatures are going to be a So this just takes it away. So this option is available in the software. So you select groups of variables and uh, say block scale these for me, and it will take care of all of the, the calculations. So first mean, center, and scale, them, and then subsequently block scale. The other place where this is used quite a bit is, um, let's say, I'm modeling raw materials, and on my raw materials I measure the density, I measure, I measure particle size 10, particle size passing 50%, and particle size passing 90%, and then I measure the infrared. So this is column 1, column 2, 3, 4, and this is column 5 to 1,000 because your near infrared spectrum has, say, 1,005. So there's 1,000 wavelengths in that near infrared spectrum. So again, leaving these as normal centuries in scale columns, columns 5 to 1,005, the whole model is basically just going to be modeling the near infrared spectrum. If I divide these, these 1,000 columns as a block, I go and divide through by the square root of a thousand, I'm reducing the influence of those variables, and it's now as if my model has one, two, three, four, five variables in it. And so it gives all these other variables a chance to participate in the model. Otherwise, you'll just be swamped by the near infrared spectrum. Okay, so block scaling we use that quite a bit for, for when we get data from one group of, so here's a group of variables, here's one type of variable density. There's three particle sizes, and there's a thousand near infrared spectrum. You could leave this as scale to unit variance, scale this group by the square root of three, so that creates one variable equivalent of particle size information, scale this by a square root of a thousand. So it's now as if your model has three variables in it density, particle size, and, and spectral information. If you've got different types of data that each type is of a homogeneous type of measurement, so if you have particle size in the infrared, block scaling is very common. Okay. And for those of you that are looking for an interesting research project, here's, here's one that's, that's often bothered me. I just haven't had the time to investigate this a bit further, so I think this would be nice. If one of you want to go ahead and do this, robust pre processing to help find outliers. So if you had to robustly pre-process your data, so median centric or scaling by the MAD, okay, any observations that were outliers in your raw data, they're not going to influence that means that median centric vector or the MAD scaling vector. But if, when you do go take that raw data with the outliers and you divide, uh, sorry, you center relative to the median and you scale relative to the MAD, that outlier is going to be a huge outlier now. 
Whereas previously with mean centering and scaling, that outlier affected the mean centering vector, it affected the scaling vector, so it's not as much an outlier by the time the PCA model gets to it. But if you have gone and median centered and, and mad scale, does that outlier actually complicate the subsequent PCA model that's built on the data? Or what if you go use robust PCA? So there's several, uh, several researchers in the last five to 10 years, robust PCA and POS has been a fairly hot topic in the journal publications. And they've all released open source software that you can go download and use for it. So there's a good one called uh, ROB PCA. And I forget the name of the PLS one. But if you go robust pre-processing and follow it up by robust PCA, do you need to do robust pre-processing first? Can you just get by with the robust PCA afterwards? Right, so these are all some questions that I have or that you might have. The other place that you can, uh, sorry, and just to come back to the robust PCA and robust PLS, this, these codes are based on using the loadings calculated from the eigenvectors which come from the covariance matrix. So they first calculate x transpose x, and then they go calculate the eigenvectors in a robust way. So they don't, they don't allow outliers to dominate x transpose x. But what if we are missing data and we can't form x transpose x? We could go back to the Niepels algorithm, which really is just a set of linear regressions, and replace that linear regression step inside Niepels with a robust linear regression. So there's several robust least squared methods out there. There's two keys algorithm. You can use quantiles and medians. You can use the hat values from a regression to downweight outliers afterwards. So if in this internal Niepels algorithm I go and replace ordinary least squares with a robust equivalent, will my Niepels algorithm still converge? I don't know. And will it be just as fast? Will it, will it be a meaningful PCA model? So there's a lot of interesting ideas that one can look at here in terms of robustness. And they reviewed some of these topics at least, not, the, not the these questions here, otherwise I wouldn't have asked them, <laughs> because otherwise I could have just read this paper. But this paper by uh, Phil Moser and Todorov is a new, new review that's just appeared on some multivariate uh, robust tools. So that's a good starting point if you want to get into this project, just to understand what the state of the art is right now and then maybe go look at some of these questions. There may be many more questions. The reason why this topic is so fundamentally important, you'll see later on today when we talk about automatic model building. More and more, these PCA and PLS models are being built in a totally automated way without humans ever looking at them. So if you go look at a score plot or a T-squared or SPE plot, you can very quickly pick out the outliers, exclude, rebuild, exclude, rebuild, and you follow that procedure two or three times until you get a fairly good model. But a computer has no notion of that. And in many cases, we still want to get these advantages of the robust methods, but without actually having to go look at the data ourselves. And the case of that comes from, from, let's say we're looking at building a monitoring model that's going to be used over a number of years. My process here, let's say in year one, versus year two, year three, is going to change and, and adjust with time, right? So the, the model I build now in year one is not going to be applicable necessarily in year three. Things have moved around a bit. So I want, to, I want this monitoring model, I want a predictive PLS model to maybe do a soft sensor, but I don't want every couple of months to rebuild that model. I want to let the computer go ahead and rebuild that model without being affected by outliers and still give me good predictions and still give me a good monitoring system. Okay? So I would definitely need a robust tool to build that model. So this is, this, this is tremendously an important topic. One other way that people deal with outliers in a kind of a crude fashion at least is to use what's called Windsorizing. And that it makes a little bit of assumption of norm, normally distributed variables. So if you are normally distributed or, or, or roughly, you can say, well, here's my upper level alpha percent, 95%. Well, actually, sorry, that's one minus alpha, and this is alpha. So if alpha is 5%, that's 100 minus alpha. 
I can discard any data univariately. So I go do this on one column, then I move to the next, to the next. So for each column, I go and discard the data that's outside 95% and below 5%. I have two options when I discard that data. One is I can just go replace that data point that's an outlier with the value on the line. Okay. So I go change that data point. Instead of being at that level, I just bring it down slightly. This point that's below the outlier, I just shift it up slightly. That's Windsorizer which I don't like at all because you're basically adjusting the data to make it something different. Trimming is a lot more honest. It just replaces that value with the missing value. And here, set as missing. So the, the algorithm just sees now extra missing data and it doesn't know that this was initially a point that was far out. But again, I'm, it's still a little bit suboptimal because by setting it to missing, you're telling the model it doesn't exist, which really isn't true. Okay? You should, in practice, go investigate these outliers because they actually are sometimes outliers are your most interesting data points. They were when you were operating the process either really well or really bad, so you can learn a lot from them. But from a model building point of view, you may want to just exclude them. But that learning part, actually, don't ever discard outliers without investigating because I've seen that in too many situations where the outliers were the most informative data points that uh, we figured out the problem in the process based on the outliers. The outliers are very often kind of a free design experiment that was run in the process for you. Because you'll find when you start working, your boss will not allow you to run experiments on the process because you create product that's all specification, they have to deal with it, you have to schedule special operator time to change the process for you in DOE. But <laughs> you'll often, if you just go look back at your historical data, you'll see that they've inadvertently adjusted the process. Someone's made a mistake and pushed through a batch of materials into the system that really shouldn't have been. And these are kind of free experiments for you. They always show up as outliers. And so if you just go send them as missing and never investigate them, you're actually missing out on some important information. So these are the two options. You'll see this in the software, Windsorizing and trimming uh, available to you. I personally never use them. But if you do see them and wondering what they are, that's, that's how they're being used. This uh, topic here of univariate transformations is, is actually quite important. You've, you've seen this before in these squares and in undergraduate courses, no doubt. If you know a certain variable has a nonlinear relationship to other variables in the data set, the transformation of that nonlinearity to get back to a linear situation can help improve the model. So as follows, I took a, val a variable xk and xj. So these are two variables in my data set that I have. And the raw data here with blue shows distinct curvature. This is an actual, uh, some actual data that I had. And there's definite, a definite uh, quadratic or some exponential relationship between those two variables. First center the, uh, sorry, first transform the data. So first take, say, a square root transform or a log of the data. And then you center and scale it. And you'll get a much more linear relationship between the two variables. So in blue, my original data was not centered and scaled. But here what I've shown in blue is the raw data after centering and scaling. So that's why it's all centered at zero and scaled up to the same amount. But the original data was all positive, right? Well, because you can't, I think I took a square root transform here. You can't take a square root of the negative value. So the original data was it. XK was definitely positive. So I'm showing it to you after centering scale. So to do the transformation, we usually do the transformations on the raw data. And then you go and sub, uh, uh, go continue on with the preprocessing of centering scale. So you can use things like logs, division, all of these are really actually the same. They come from what's called the family of transformations where you're really converting XK transformed comes from multiplying XK to a certain power P. Okay. And P can be, P is two, you're obviously 
you're making a squared transformation of it. If p is equal to 1, you're making no change to the data. p equals a half, you're taking the square root transformation. p is equal to 0 is not possible. Mathematically, you'll just get a 1 if you implement this in computer. But in terms of severity, like this is obviously more severe. In terms of severity, this is the equivalent of taking the log of, of the variance. But mathematically, you can't implement it. And then you can go even to negative powers. So that's taking the inverse square root from p to the minus 1, as in this case here, where you're just taking the inversion of the variance. So this is called the ladder of powers and roots. And in terms of their severity of what they do, they kind of go this way. This also starts to get more severe again. Okay, but, and then roughly equivalent to taking the log of the variable. All these options are available in the software. Yeah. So when you, when you say severity, the data you're working on. I, the reason why we make the transformation is, let's say, coming back to that example I used last class, where we had the read vapor pressure, and we know that it's, it's related to the inverse pressure. If I put pressure in my model, so in my, in my data set, I've got P in my, as one of the variables in my X space, and I've got REP in my Y space, I'm going to get an adequate model. But if I put 1 over p in my x space at rvp, this column for 1 over p is going to get a lot more weight because it's much closer aligned to what's really happening in practice. Okay? So that's why I say they're often motivated by your first principles knowledge. If you know that the log of temperature is more closely aligned to your y variable, put that in by all means. In fact, what I've done in many cases is I know the log of a variable is closely aligned to, to, to my y, but I know that temperature in and of itself is more closely aligned to one of my other x variables. So now what do I do? I just put log, put the log of p and p, or log of temperature and temperature. Yes, they'll be correlated, but PCA handles correlation. PLS handles correlation. So that's that's just fine, putting leaving both the scales with both the transformed and untransformed columns in. But we usually pick transformations that match what we know about the process. The other thing is knowing about this ladder of power and roots, if you see a log transform, it's still not kind of getting rid of the curvature for you. You go one step up and one step up. And you'll eventually get to a point where you're, at, you're going to make the curvature go the other way. And you know you've gone too far and it's going to come back down this ladder of power and roots. And obviously you can use any value in between here. Right? So you don't, if you, you might find that 1.5 does a better job than either 1 or 2. So then you just use 1.5. It may not be and be interpretable, but if you're building a soft sensor, you just want good predictions. You don't really care too much about the underlying first principles of it. Do we do we worry any relationships between model uh, in between when we start when we transform this data from say that this is not going to occur to a more linear relationship? Are we Transforming some, not others. So. Right. Yeah. So, like I said, you, you're definitely improving the relationship here between X J and X K. Uh, you're making them far more correlated, so that they'll show up in the loading plots as having a positive correlation, much stronger than, say, in the raw form. In the raw form, you'll still see a positive correlation, but not quite as strong. But you're absolutely right. You may be breaking the correlation to another variable. That's why I said. Sometimes leave in the transformed and the untransformed as a new variable, just in case there's some other relationships that you don't know of. Because there's no way we can hope to go through every combination of um, like this in our data set. So just leave them all in. So the proof of log scale here? Uh, well, you've only introduced a second variable, so it's unlikely you're going to swap them on with, with totally new information. So yeah, I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to block scale my transformed and untransformed variable. 
to split them both in with equal weight. Just one thing to be aware of, if you do take some of these, uh, these uh, powers or, or, or roots here, you may have to bias the variable up or down first, depending on its uh, units. For example, if temperature is measured in Celsius, and we, remember we do this transformation ahead of time before we set and scaling, we may actually have negative temperatures. So we first need to shift the whole temperature scale up, then take the log to prevent taking logs of zeros or negative numbers, and then we go and scale and center that, that uh, process, that transform variable. And you can take transformations of either x and or y variables. So it's not just the x space that this is. One other thing that works really well uh, for chemical processes is if we have the additional knowledge, we want to bring that in. And so don't, we don't want to rely just on the variables we happen to have measured in our database. If we know that certain quantities are important to our process, we should definitely go add those in as extra columns, which we call calculated variables. So it's very common to see heat balances in fact, that the FASCO monitoring case uh, that we looked at back in the monitoring section, they go take those temperatures and they do a heat balance on their slab in real time. And they, they do that by adding the heat inputs, the heat outputs, and any, well, they don't have reaction in any particular case, but if you had a system with heat created or lost, you would add those columns in. So you just add additional columns. Now when Let's say your heat input doesn't match your heat output anymore. You're going to break the correlation structure and it's going to show up as an SPE alarm. You wouldn't have necessarily seen that if you had just left temperature in as a variable. But now because you've done these extra calculations, you're going to see a broken correlation structure in your calculated variables. So again, it depends on your objective what you want to achieve. If you want a very sensitive monitoring model that you knew your main problem in this process was due to the imbalance in, in how heat is moved around in the system. Definitely add these additional columns in and they should pick up in your monitoring system. You can also do the same for mass balances. There's a, a link there to Dr. Crow, who used to be here at the faculty. One of his students worked on this uh, a while back. Sometimes there's certain performance indicators for your process that are important. Um, for example, I did some work in the lumber industry and they have a particular metric that they monitor, monitor every day. Right? It's the recovery of the wood. So the, the, the volume of wood going in minus uh, the scrap that's produced and then that, the, red, the leftover is the, the, the boards that they sell to Home Depot or so on. So there's inputs minus outputs and they track that ratio of their recovery. How much wood are they recovering from the process? That's a key performance indicator. So that gets added into new variable. If you know, for example, that these, these forces that, that in your process, you just say the Reynolds number or the power number if you're dealing with the mixing system, this is very important. Power number is, is can describe how well you're being you're mixing your, your, your unit, uh, sorry, your, your, your reactor. Or this case of the salt sensors where we saw we added in a calculated variable. Yes, I'm trying to predict RVP in, in my Y space from the lab, but nothing prevents me from adding this entire calculation as one of my X variables. So I know pressure in my distillation column, I know temperature, I know what these coefficients are in my model. I go add it in as, a, as an X space variable. And I also leave in my X space the temperatures and pressures that I used to as well in this model. In fact, I would add inverse temperature and I would add log of pressure to my X space in this case. In addition to this entire nonlinear term, and I found, I found uh, actually I'll maybe give this data set to you for one of the homework uh, assignments. You'll find that this term here, this calculated variable, gets the most weight in the, in the, in the soft sensor model because it's the closest aligned to the Y variable that you're predicting from the lab. So this kind of, this term gets you in the ballpark of the predicted value, and then the PLS model gives some weight to pressure and temperature, which gets even better predictions still. Okay, so Petro Canada, when they applied their soft sensor online, they were only using this to predict 
by repeat. But the moment they add it back into their model, into their PLS model, some of the other terms from the distillation column, the improvement in, in RMSEP and R squared went up. Because you're getting some of the other other uh, properties from the, sorry, some of the other variants in the, in the variables in the data set were important to predicting RVP, not just the calculated RVP. Does it mean if you have a model with like, uh, like, uh, like a balance in the balance, if you add a boost, like you spend the exchanges from, from that second point, and that happens with your, your, uh, your estimation or your model? Or if you're you building a, a soft sensor model, you'll almost always find that it will go up. Put it this way. I doubt that I've never seen a case where you're just adding stuff to your to your X space decreases your predictive ability of your model. If anything, PLS and PCA, they'll just put zero weight on it if it's not important. You can go try that. Take a PLS model that works pretty well and just add columns of random numbers to it. We'll see that in an example later today. It disregards those columns of random numbers and still gets roughly the same performance in terms of predictive. So it doesn't ever hurt to add stuff in, even though it, you don't necessarily know it will benefit you. Okay? You can add it in, then go look at the weights for that variable, look at the coefficients, and look at the VIP value. Do they get any, do they show to be important? If not, you can remove them again afterwards. But the biggest problem I face with when I work with companies is they don't want to go do all this work and then find out it wasn't useful. And so that the questions are, well, well, will it be useful if I go calculate these heat balances? Well, you can't answer that up front. But if you go and do the work, add it in, and then you see it, it does not have high weights, doesn't have high VIP, or the coefficients are small, then you've got good evidence that, in fact, it didn't have any benefits. I mean, if you have, if you have, if you have a model, for example, like in Japan, you're going to jump your control, your origin and decisions, and then you actually yeah. look like something to get an output, so you can use those. Absolutely. If you've got a simulator, you've, you've got free reign, but uh, yeah, in, in yeah. practice we don't have that. So you don't want to go do all this extra work and then find out it doesn't, it doesn't help you out. How are we doing? Any, any questions on that so far? No. Okay, I'll just handle uh, this section on qualitative variables and categorical variables and we take a little break. Um, very often we have these types of variables. In this case, binary variables. It's a type of categorical variable with only two categories, yes or no, on or off, present, absent. It's a, a dichotomous variable would be another name for it. And what you can do in your model and your X space is you just leave it in, the same as any other variable. You don't do anything special to it. The only uh, risk that you take with that variable is, is the following is if you've got an imbalance in the relative number of rows and columns. So let's take this variable xk as a categorical variable, and I've got n rows in my data set. And let's say I've only got a couple of zeros, and then I've got a 1, and a 0, 0, 0, 0, and a 1. There's obviously far more zeros than 1s in that data set. Okay? And when I calculate the mean centering, for this particular column, the mean is going to be biased much, much closer to zero. So on a scale, if I had to plot it this way, it's zero and a one. I've got a ton of zeros up here, and I've only got two ones. And if I had to look at it as a dot plot. So if I calculate the mean, the mean of this data set is going to sit somewhere there. So I've got a mean center relative to this point, so these points are going to be close to me, and this point's going to be really far. Then I'm going to divide through by the standard deviation of that, that column. So I'm going to upscale the relative spread. The problem in this situation is that these two rows with the one in them will actually probably appear as outliers because my mean centering is so close to the, to the majority of the, the observations within that row. So, that's one caution. If you've got a categorical variable with roughly equal numbers of zeros and ones in it, it won't present any, any particular problems to you. But the moment you get a very strong imbalance, you may have to consider something else. Uh, and the easiest is just to manually shift your mean to the midway point. So again, the software doesn't allow you to do this automatically. You have to go do this ahead in Excel or something like that. 
you force the mean equal to 0.5, and then you don't scale that column. So there's no need to scale this particular column. So force your mean to 0.5 so that after, after centric, this will be negative 0.5 and this will be 0.5. No need to scale. And then you proceed as normal. And you interpret this variable no different to any of the other variables in the values plot. Okay, a low value just means it tends towards zero, a high value in the loading plot or positive correlation and a negative correlation with this variable has the same meaning as it would have for, for a normal continuous variable. What if you got data like that in your y? Like, you we'll talk about that in, our, in two classes from now. That actually creates a very specific type of problem which we call classification problems. We'll talk about that. This is, this is for your x space. So in your x space you would just leave this as a normal variable, you don't treat it any differently unless you have this tremendous imbalance. Do you have a question? Yeah, I, I, because I have that in one of my data sets, like for the roof status. Okay. How does it, actually, I was wondering how does it, how does it have an interaction between like the whole process and such transition? I mean, like, if my roof is on or off, like, how would it actually like, be presented to the active part inside the terminal? Well, let's take, if you look at it in your loading plot, and this variable is positively correlated with another variable, it just says that when this variable is high, in other words, it's a one, the other variable is also high. And if this variable is low, in other words, it's a zero, it's, it's going to be other variable is also low. So you treat and interpret the correlations amongst these variables in the same way. But we be able to detect the outliers? Like, I mean, for example, if you have an account company, like, for example, in the past, if you have, like, from the, from the, from the software, they're using sometimes there's a delay and then the roof is actually on and then it shows it's off. It will show up as an SPE because it says the usual correlation is that when this is high, the other variable is high. And when this is low, the other variable is low. But now you've broken the correlation structure. It's a one when it should have been a zero. It will show up as a high SPE. So it's no different to any of the other variables. Okay, is there a way on the software to signal out this column and say that don't scale this and like scale everything else? Or like do you have to? There is a way to tell it not to scale a certain column. Because yeah. then if you're going to scale it separately, but you want to scale everything else. Yeah. There is a way to do that, yeah. Remind me when we look at the software to, to take a look at it. The other way you can do it is you can just leave it in your software as a variable, exclude it from your model. You don't have to include it as a variable. And then you just use it to go and color code your score plot. So I think the software has, a, has an option, color code the score plot by another variable. And then you would just pick this integer variable. And so you highlight your good versus bad operation in your score plot or SPE and T score. Questions? The other, uh, the next type of variable is a categorical variable with multiple levels, more than two levels. So these are called unordered indicators. Okay, so in the case, let's say where you've got reactor T, D, or reactor H, you've now got three levels. You could go and add it as a variable coded as 0, 1, 2, or 1, 2, 3, but really there isn't any difference between a 1 and a 2 and a 3. Like the, the, a level 3 is not better than a level 2, which is not better than a level 1. There's no particular ordering or preference to TDNA. You just want to indicate to the model that there's these three potential reactors. And maybe, maybe all your problems in your monitoring are due to the case of reactor D and not T and H. So there's no particular ordering to the to the categories here. So in this case, we just expand our X space with an extra number of columns equal to the number of unique levels in this categorical group. So in this case, I've got three levels. I'll add three new columns to my X space. Coded with a one, this first column here will correspond to reactor T. So it will be a 1 when I am using reactor T and it's a 0 when I'm not using reactor T and D and H and so on. Now if you've got many levels, like 6 or 7 of them, you're going to add 6 or 7 new columns to your model. They don't really carry independent pieces of information, so you can go lock scale that group of 7 new columns down to uh, have a weight of 1 equivalent new variable after, after this. Okay. And again, uh, coming back to your question earlier, Jake, on can you do this in the Y space? Yes, you can, and we'll, we'll look at that in the section of classification. Sure. So let's see how the first one, two, three, the first, or one, two, three. You could, 
But uh, the, the problem comes in your loadings part when you're interpreting it. And you, let's say you see a positive correlation. So now you've got one corresponding to T, two to D, and, and three to H. You're, if you see it's positively correlated, that means it's when this variable is high. Well, it could be D or it could be reactor H, but you know it's not T. But it gets even worse when you've got more and more levels, right? So how high up is it? So it doesn't make, the interpretation doesn't make sense then from, a, from, a, from that. So when they're unordered, it's best to expand your columns. If they are ordered as shown here, for this case, let's say you're dealing with financial data and your, your input is, your, so you say maybe you're deciding to give a credit card loan to someone or not. And one of your factors is their level of education. And you've got these five levels, primary school, high school, up to university. Now you can order those variables. There is a natural progression here from one up to five as being the highest level. You have even more levels there. So then you can choose to leave that as a single variable because now there is a meaning to having a low value of xk and a high value of xk. So if you're working, sometimes we're working with months of the year, you might want to code January as one, February as two, because there, again, it might be how far along in the year are you that, that is, is, is an important information in your model. And then you go ahead, as before, and interpret your loadings in the same way. If you do happen to use this as a Y variable, you would just round your prediction to the closest integer. But this is the, the biggest problem with coding it this way, is that your spacing between the levels is not equal. For example, the spacing from primary school to high school, that distance between one and two is not the same as going from college to bachelor's. Okay, I mean, you might think it is the same spacing, but it's, it's not always, right? So the level of effort required to go from one to the other is not the same as going from a further a pair further down the line. If that is the case, then rather expand that variable into multiple columns again. Okay. This often comes up in uh, questionnaires. So you rate something as, I didn't enjoy this, I somewhat enjoyed this, this was okay, or I super enjoyed it as a level five. My, my decision of do I rate it from one being low and up to five high, Firstly, it's different to say someone else's. And secondly, for me, going from one to two is not the same as going from four to five. So it's a similar idea there. Uh, or taste preferences. We often see this in sensory panels. If the judge has to rate something on a scale of one to 10, there's like poor tasting stuff. If it's so tastes terrible, they'll give it a one, but they could have given it a two. So they're kind of equivalent. Versus they're much more reluctant to give higher scores the higher up they go. Okay? Or if you're, uh, Say at the Olympics, if you look at judges scoring for certain sporting events, it's the same same idea. They're very reluctant to give a high scores, but they'll give up low scores quite easily. So you get this clustering at the lower end. Okay, let's take a break.